Hi, everybody. I would like to talk to you about a new Xen feature called cache coloring that greatly improves determinism of real-time workloads when deployed on Xen. First, uh, let me start by um, talking about why we are doing real-time uh, and in, what, in, in the context of hypervisors. So hypervisors in embedded are used for consolidation of different workloads uh, or splitting up a single unit into multiple separate components that needs to be isolated, deploying them all on a single SOC. Um, now, the level, the degrees of isolation uh, can be uh, many uh, and uh, in, under, you know, under different aspects. So one aspect is security. So you don't want something running in one VM to be able to uh, steal the data uh, or uh, get inside another virtual machine. Another dimension is reliability. We want uh, an application running on one VM, even if it crashes, not to be able to affect the rest of the system. Um, so, you know, it, it's often the case and not all software is made equal. Something is more reliable, something is, not rel is less reliable. When you put them together on a single SOC, you want to make sure that the less reliable software doesn't really affect the most reliable software. This even without safety certification requirements, but in many uh, environments, safety certifications are actually required, such as automotive, some uh, environment in industrial, uh, aviation, they need safety certification, in which case one of the VN might be safety certified, uh, and definitely you cannot really afford the non-safety certified VM uh, to affect the safety certified VM. So these are all dimensions of isolation, and I would like to add one more to the list, which is real-time isolation. So if you have one workload that has real-time requirements or latency requirements, that needs to work correctly without interference, no matter what you're running on the side. You could be running something like a much larger OS uh, on the, uh, alongside on another VM, and definitely the larger OS should not be able to affect negatively to have any impact on your RTOS. So in this context, um, Xen has always had a pretty decent set of features, uh, one of which is uh, CPU pools. So Xen is able to uh, configure a group of CPU cores called pools, and um, you run different schedulers on different pools. In this example, we have a four cores SOC creating two pools, the blue pool at the top and the orange pool at the bottom. Uh, and we are running the default scheduler, which is credit at the bottom, which is you know, a data center scheduler made to run more vCPUs and physical CPUs on the, on available. And at the top, we are running the null scheduler that, you know, as the name suggests, is really doing nothing, nothing at all. So that's, in fact, the best possible scheduler for RQ latency because the scheduler really does, doesn't interrupt VMs and really doesn't do any scheduling. You can do better than credit, though, if you have, even if you have more virtual CPUs and physical CPUs, because uh, there are others, uh, uh, other schedulers uh, that come with Zen, such as uh, RTDS, which is a real-time scheduler, should still allow you to run more virtual CPUs than physical CPUs on the platform uh, while still maintaining uh, real-time performance and real-time uh, uh, still providing real-time guarantees. That said, no, there is nothing really better than the null scheduler because simply it's, it's the best, does nothing. So if you want the minimum possible latency and assign fully a, a CPU core to, uh, to a, a VM, the null scheduler does exactly that. Uh, I see a question about how do you change the scheduler? So it's very easy to do it from the boot time. Uh, you just pass this option, sched equal null, and that allows you to change the scheduler used for all CPUs from the default, which is credit, to null. So in fact, if you want to try uh, real time, that is the quickest and easiest way possible, just uh, switch to null. Now, this is where things get interesting. So you would think that using the NAS scheduler is more than enough to get real time. Unfortunately, things are more complicated than that. 
on most arms SOCs, including the reference uh, board that I use for this presentation and demos that you see later, the Xalinx Ultrascale Plus and PSOC, uh, there is a shared L2 cache on the, on the board, plus a private L1 cache for each core. The shared L2 cache is, is shared across all cores. What that means is um, one application running on one core doing heavy memory operations can affect the performance of, the, of another application running on a different core. So in, um, in this picture, for instance, something running on core four um, might do a heavy memory operation like memcop is in a loop, end up uh, causing cache, ev cache line evictions. Uh, therefore, when your real-time application, application running on core number one, um, is running, it might actually end up even missing a deadline because of that. So we, we started, I, you know, the presentation saying, uh, that hypervisors should guarantee interference, free systems, right? Interference, uh, should be free from interference, even from a real time point of view. But due to the L2 cache, unless we do something specific and special, uh, there is no way to avoid L2 you know, cache interference. This has nothing to do with hypervisor per se, by the way, right? This is just a property of the SOC. So it could happen exactly the same if you're running an application on Linux on one core and another application on the same Linux on a different core, uh, just because a shared cache is present. So what's the solution? The solution is we want to really ideally split the cache lines, split the cache into separate subset and give each, uh, each VM one subset. So the hypervisor should be able to split this cache, this L2 cache into subgroup and dedicate one group for each VM. That way, one VM cannot cause interference uh, to the other VM. So this technology is called cache coloring. And let me provide a bit more details. So the idea is really to understand and study the way memory addresses get end up um, being related to cache lines in L2 and then make it so that uh, one VM end up always using the same set of cache lines, which are unique and different from all the others. And that is implemented by choosing carefully the memory to allocate to each VM. If we choose the memory in a way so that when you the VM does actually memory accesses end up always using the same set of cache lines that we chose, then the problem is solved. And, you know, on, on the Xalinx and PSOC, uh, it end up being one page every 16. So it means allocating for one VM, page zero, page 16, and so on, skipping the one in the middle. Um, let me, I'll, I'll answer the other question at the end, which I'll keep forward um, for the moment on the uh, presentation. So what, the way we implemented um, the, uh, the cache coloring in Zen, first of all, we automatically detected the waste size, uh, which can be done via registers, or it can be also passed via common line option to override or making sure that you set the waste size correctly. On the Xilinx and PSOC, uh, the waste size is 64K. Now 64K is uh, order 16. That means you have 16 bit uh, of address to play with. 12 bits are dedicated for the offset within the page, right? Uh, you, we cannot really allocate memory at a finer granularity than a page. That means we have four bits left uh, to um, specify the color. The color being the minimum set of um, cache line that we allocate to each VM. So if you look here at the slide, uh, you see the color bit mask being 0xf000. Uh, this f, these four bits are the one deciding the color. Uh, this is how a uh, memory address end up being either one color or the other. Because there are four bits, that means there are 16 possible colors. We call them by numbers. So on the Xilinx Ultrascale Plus and PSOC, the colors goes, the color go from zero to 15. And again, the memory allocation is page zero, no, 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 page 16, and so forward. Um, 
the next things we did is we allocate, we created, we start, we, we wrote a new memory allocator. So the traditional memory allocator is called body on Zen. Um, and what we did is added a new memory allocator that is colored. So understand colors. And what it does is keep pages on list, one list for each color. So we have on, again, on Xilinx, uh, MPSC, we have 16 lists, one for each color page order by address on each list. So basically you ask, please give me a page from color number three, and you pick the page, the highest, the topmost page on the list for color three. The color, uh, like the color allocator can be used for both Zen memory as well as virtual machine memory. When I say Zen memory, I mean the memory used by the hypervisor itself. Okay, now, if you're interested in trying this out, um, this is the right time to pay attention. So um, on this on the slide, you see uh, the configuration needed to get cache coloring working. Uh, the waste size uh, here on the first line is, um, to the, is an optional param command line parameter for Xen to uh, specify the waste size. Again, optional because under normal circumstances, it can be automatically detected. The next two parameters are really fundamental. Xen colors specify the colors to be used for Xen allocations themselves. So for Xen memory, uh, that's gonna be used by the hypervisor only. The hypervisor does not, does not use much memory at all. So one color is more than enough. DOM0 colors specify the colors to be used for DOM0 memory allocation. Now, I think this is the right time to stop for a second and explain how colors and memory allocation interact. So on Xilinx MPSOC, uh, each color roughly corresponds to 256 megabytes of RAM. That means if you specify Xen colors equal zero, you're giving up to 256 megabytes of RAM for Xen memory, which is way more than enough. And when you specify DOM0 colors from one to six for DOM0, it means you have up to one gigabyte and 256 megabyte for DOM0. This does not automatically mean that you are allocating one gigabyte and 256 megabyte to DOM0 because you still have a separate parameter, the good old DOM0 mem parameter to specify the memory for DOM0. The reason why we kept it separate is to have maximum flexibility. This way, for instance, you can decide to uh, not use all the memory po possibly available from these colors. And because we, you want to reuse this color in another VM. For instance, you could even create a VM that partially shares DOM0 colors and partially does not share DOM0 colors. And the reason for sharing colors with DOM0 could be to set up a ring in memory for communication, uh, to exchange data and so on. So that way you can select the memory allocation the way you like, your colors the way you like, and you really are, the, you have the maximum po possible flexibility in setting up the system. Now, of course, if you choose color from one to six for DOM0, that covers up to megabyte, but then you ask DOM0 to be allocated to gigabyte of memory, that is not gonna work, right? There is gonna be a failure, an error message, and you have to try again configuring the system. Um, DOM zero-less DOM use and other DOM use. So DOM zero-less DOM use are other virtual machines that are started directly at boot um, by Xen. So they are booted in parallel, in parallel to DOM zero and without DOM zero having to do anything at all. Um, these DOM zero-less DOM use have their own configuration, which is uh, specified on device tree. So like all the other parameters for, the, for these DOM zero-less DOM use, we added one option in device tree to specify the colors. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit mask. So in this case, color 0x80 means actually color number seven. So that is to specify color seven for this uh, DOM zero less VM, which you see later in the demo setup is the one doing actually latency measurements. Finally, uh, we have one option for uh, regular DOM use. So that's, these are the one that you start normally after DOM0 is fully booted from the command line, 
with the Excel tool and you do Excel create to start these VMs. Uh, there is one more option called colors to specify, to specify the ranges and the list of colors that you like to dedicate for these domains. All right. Um, I want to show you um, a bunch of benchmarks and results that really show you and highlight the uh, value of this technology. The benchmark were run on the Xilinx MPSOC. Um, the VM to measure, uh, to take measurements, is a, bare, a little bare metal application. Um, a bare metal application is just an app running in um, kernel space written in C with a few libraries uh, that are, you know, for, uh, for, dri for drivers, for accessing the UART. Um, but basically, it's not even an OS. An OS is smaller than a unikernel. It's really, it's really very tiny, and that makes a great testing or uh, environment uh, because it's very controlled. Um, we are also using a bare metal application for causing stress on the system, so mem copies uh, and so on. The color configuration is here on the slide. So we chose two colors, for example, because we had to spare. But actually, one is more than enough. Uh, we chose four and seven for the motor control domu, eight and eleven for the first stress domu, twelve and fifteen for the other stress domu, and then we also had a Linux VM doing stress as well. But let's jump to the results. Ah, yeah. First, something very important. So as you try to reproduce these numbers, at first attempt, you might see something slightly different. And that could very well be because you end up using the L1 cache all the time instead of the L2 cache. Now, this is critical. So these applications that we use for test tend to be very small, you know, as we said, you know, bare metal application maybe. Um, so um, they, they end up maybe fitting entirely into, into the L1 cache. And if so, the L1 cache is going to mask the interference effect on the L2 cache. To actually be able to measure the L2 cache interference, you need to make sure your L1 is not really masking your uh, interference effects. Um, and one way to do that is, is a bit uh, rough, but it, it works, is to issue um, cache cleaning operation at the right time during the cycle of the, uh, the, the, the benchmark. All right, so the first set of uh, results are related to um, a motor control execution time. So we are running an example routine as example routine to uh, control a motor, and we are measuring the time it takes to run this uh, this routine. The first slide here is showing uh, the uh, the results without interference. So it's really here just as a reference. The uh, the column on the left is the bare metal application alone. The second column is Xen without cache coloring. So the bare metal application running as a DOM U on Xen. And the column on the right is the bare metal application running as a DOM U on Xen with cache coloring enabled. Lower is better because it's the time it takes to run the, um, to run the operation. And is in nanosecond. The leftmost column, the one of the bare metal application alone, is actually quite large, and that's because there is a bit more variance on the results compared to uh, the uh, bare metal application on Zen. So strangely enough, without interference, is better on Zen than alone. This is a bit strange, but it can happen sometimes with virtualization. But I think really the important message from this slide, the takeaway message is they are all. A below 2000 or 2050 nanoseconds. Now, let's add interference. If we add interference, we see that the bare metal application goes above 6000 nanoseconds, so it gets far worse. The bare metal application running on Zen without cache coloring also get worse, close to 8000 nanoseconds. Um, while the bare metal application running on Xen alone with cache coloring enabled, so not alone with another VM doing interference, uh, it's, uh, is still the same value, still below 2000 nanoseconds. 
So this is, um, I'll take the opportunity to explain how we add the, the interference. So in the case of the Vermetal application, we are running another um, thread on a separate processor doing interference. In the case of Zen, we are starting a different DOM mu, a different VM, uh, running the bare metal application doing interference. So we can add one more. This is with two threads doing, in, two, uh, two VMs doing interference, so two processors being used to do mem copies. The bare metal application still get worse. The bare metal application running on Xen without cache coloring, which is a second column, get close to 10,000 10, nanoseconds, so again, get worse. But the bare metal application running on Xen with cache coloring enabled, it's still fine. So the effect is minimal, still around 2,000 nanoseconds. We can increase interference yet again by adding one more process doing mem copies. And we can see the bare metal application, you know, get worse. Uh, the uh, bare metal application running on Xen without cache coloring um, gets close to 12,000 nanoseconds, while the bare metal application running on Xen with cache coloring enabled is still below 2,000 nanoseconds. So we have a summary slide here um, where you can see uh, is, is the same result you have just seen, just on the same slide. So the first two columns are Xen without cache coloring and Xen with, ca and with cache coloring, without interference. And then the second two columns are Xen without cache coloring, with interference. Final column is Xen with cache coloring and with interference. So here you can really see on a single diagram how Xen without cache coloring goes from below 2,000 nanoseconds to close to 8,000 nanoseconds. And then with cache coloring enabled is basically stable. There's a minimal, minimal effect. The second benchmark that we run, um, then it might interest you even more, is about the interrupt latency. In the sense of the difference between the time when the interrupt service routine runs and the time the interrupt was expected to fire. The timer that we used is uh, a timer in programmable logic, but you should be able to reproduce these results on any of the timers uh, on the Xilinx and PSOC, including uh, the TTC timer and the Arch timer. So these are, as, as before, the results without interference. The bare metal application alone is uh, below 500 and a, a bit slightly below 500 nanoseconds. The bare metal application on Zen is around 2,500 nanoseconds. The column in the middle is Zen without cache coloring. The coloring on the right is Zen with, with cache coloring. The reason why without interference, the interrupt latency is higher on Zen, that's because on ARM, the interrupts get delivered first to the hypervisor, and then the hypervisor injects a corresponding virtual interrupt into the virtual machine. So the code path is longer on uh, when running with, with Zen or any other hypervisors. Uh, so the RQ latency is going to be a bit higher. Again, the takeaway here, though, is not really the little difference, but that they are really below 3,000 nanoseconds, around 2,500. And you see how much they jump when we increase inter when we add interference. So adding interference uh, causes Xen without cache coloring to go above 10,000 nanoseconds, and Xen with cache coloring, as usual as before, to stay the same to stay at 3,000 nanoseconds. So the effect, it, it's really small, really minimal. Note that the bare metal application also jumps forward uh, significantly uh, in proportion to its 500 nanoseconds of interference, but in absolute number, uh, it's lower than uh, or with an hypervisor. So we added one more thread causing interference, doing mem copies, and again, then without cache coloring goes to uh, close to 15,000 nanoseconds. Xen with cache coloring is still at 3,000. 
And yet again, we had one more source of interference and the bare metal, actually, I don't have the number for the bare metal application, but the, the number for Xen without cache coloring go a bit higher again. And the Xen with cache coloring is extremely stable. So this is just a, a diagram as before to see all the results on a single, on a single uh, diagram. Um, as you can see, the bare metal application get a bit higher. Xen with cache coloring is basically stable as 3000. And Xen without cache coloring is really suffering from interference and the latency really gets higher. So in conclusion, um, Xen with cache coloring offer much lower execution times uh, for your motor control uh, routine under stress. It also offer much lower RQ latency under stress. And even more importantly, it offers a much improved determinism on the results. Um, and in fact, the results have far, far lower variance compared to um, Xen without cache coloring. So Xen cache coloring is effective to reduce cache interference. And uh, I think it does enable uh, deployment of highly sensitive real-time workloads on Xen. Now, what I want to show you is, ah, well, status. I have, before, the, before showing you a demo, I'm gonna give you a quick update on the latest status of um, cache coloring. All the patches are public and online as the Xilinx Zen tree, uh, the latest branch is released 2020.01 and has all the cache coloring patches. Um, make sure to enable cache coloring in the K config of the hypervisor if you wanna use it. The upstreaming has yet to start, but it should be started soon. The other limitation that we currently have is um, there is a missing uh, there is a missing component in Linux. Uh, today, it, Linux expects to be mapped one to one, which is not the case when Linux is running uh, when one Linux expects to be mapped one to one when it's running as DOM zero on Xenon ARM. It's not the case when you enable cache coloring. As a consequence, PV drivers don't quite work correctly. So this is one of the things we're going to solve. Uh, we're going to solve in the remaining months of the year. So by the end of the year, we're aiming at fixing this issue. But today, if you're doing a static partitioning setup, so all resources directly assigned, um, it will work just fine. So only if you use PV drivers like PV network or PV block, you can run into issues. Okay, so let me show you the demo setup. Um, uh, there is Zen running and I assign color zero to Zen. Color one to six to DOM zero. DOM zero is just a, a normal uh, Yocto Linux build. Um, the bare metal latency measurement application is just a tiny application build with Xilinx SDK. The Xilinx SDK comes with, um, uh, with a way to build these tiny bare metal apps in C that runs in kernel space. And I wrote one that measures latency based on the TTC timer. And also there is another uh, bare metal application that we're gonna start by hand from DOM zero uh, to cause memory stress. The bare metal memory uh, stress application has basically no, no output, no console, nothing, just doing mem, mem copies. The bare metal latency measurement application, the one on the right, the blue one, as the TT timer, the TT timer directly assigned, and the second UART directly assigned, so that you can see the output. On the screen, I just uh, copy pasted uh, the interrupt service routine just to, uh, to give you an idea on how the latency is measured in the system um, when the interrupt fires. And I also uh, copy pasted the uh, interference main loop, as you can see, is actually quite trivial. All right, uh, it's time for the demo. So let me share my screen. It's gonna take some time. So here, I am booting first uh, the uh, the system 
uh, without cache colony enabled. So while the system um, setups, I can also show you uh, the configuration for uh, later when I'm going to boot the system with cache colony enabled. So this is a U-boot boot script that I'm using to add the configuration parameters a boot. Um, and um, as you can see here, I gave uh, one, th uh, one gigabyte and 200 megabyte to DOM0, one virtual CPU. Uh, I chose an out scheduler. I also set up VW5 for native, which is a very important parameter if you want to minimize latency. I specified waste size equal 64K, also it should be automatically detected, so it's not really necessary. And then color zero for Zen and color one to six for DOM zero. Here, this is the configuration for your uh, DOM zero less DOM U. And as I mentioned on the slide, I gave color seven to, um, uh, to the DOM zero less DOM U. See if the system is starting. It's TFTTP in the binaries. So here, Xen is starting, then DOM0. In parallel, in the meanwhile, the uh, DOM0 less VM is already started, and you can see it's taking measurements in nanoseconds. This is my second UART. I'm going to go back to the first UART. DOM0 has finished booting. If I look, there is one VM running without a name because it's the DOM0 less VM. Uh, it has 128 megabytes of RAM. I'm going to start now the additional VM causing, um, causing interference. And uh, the colors really here don't matter because I compiled out the colors, coloring support. But this is what you're going to see later when I do it with cache coloring enabled. Now, now this DOM U is not outputting anything because really has no console, uh, but if you're going to see the FET quite soon. So here is jumping four from 4,300 to 10,000, then 16,000, and is basically staying at 15,000 nanoseconds. So there is a very significant jump in uh, interrupt latency. Now I'm going to reboot the system um, by uh, making it boot then with, with cache coloring enabled. And it's going to take some time uh, for the reboot. Um, so bear with me. But what you'll see is that there is no effect, close to no effect of the interrupt latency when cache coloring is enabled. The board is running here on my desk at home, by the way. Um, if you hear the fan noise, that's what it is. I'm TFTTing all the binaries. That's really not the fastest way to boot, but it's extremely convenient for development and testing. Very easy to replace the binaries as you need. All right, now I'm going to scroll up and show you that DOM0 boot is, sorry, then a boot is going to print all the interesting configuration, including the waste size, the color bits in the address, the maximum number of colors, the size of each color in terms of memory. The color chosen for Xen is a bit mask, so that's color zero. The colors chosen for DOM0, which are one to six. The colors chosen for the DOM0 less. DOM U here. Ah, yes, so here the interrupt latency, well, is already lower actually than before, 2,900 nanoseconds. But most importantly, we're going to start uh, as before the stress VM. We should see that there are three VMs running now. And as you can see, it's pretty, I mean, 
is th there is barely no jump in latency. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing now and take any questions that you might have. So yes, uh, so the first question is about whether uh, there is any benefit into segmenting the cache. Yes, there is definitely a benefit as you saw from the benchmarks uh, and it really, it, see, it really shows when there is interference. So this is very important actually. If you don't have any interference in the system, actually, not only there is no difference, but it's better to allocate the memory contiguously. So the, the more contiguous the allocation is, the better are the caching effects. So if you have a system that, you know, is, uh, is, there is no interference, you do the measurement and you are surprised that cache coloring is slightly worse. That's not surprising, that's normal. So cache coloring, the, the purpose of cache coloring is to prevent interference effect. So, yeah, so you need to have a source of interference in a separate VM to really see the benefits of this technology. The slides are definitely available for download um, and they're gonna be available. I already provided them to the Linux Foundation so you'll, you'll be able to download them on and as soon as the talk ends. Are there any, any other questions or observation on, uh, on this technology or the benchmarks? I know there were, uh, was a lot of data on the screen. So if you want to go back to one of the slides, just, just, just ask. Well, um, Xen, um, so Xen is the name of the hypervisor that was chosen uh, to base its work on. Um, technically, the full name is Xen Project, but in the community, we, typ we typically refer to the hypervisor as simply Xen. Um, and the name goes back to 15, 20 years now. So, you know, so when I say Xen cache coloring, what I really mean is, the cache coloring feature for the Xen hypervisor. Any other questions on the slides, the benchmarks or anything? Ah, I saw one. Um, so yes, Zen. Um, so we colored Zen too. So the uh, so hi Jan. Um, so yes, so the the Zen itself it's colored. So uh, the text of the Zen hypervisor uh, it gets relocated in a colored fashion, so that the colors are respected. Otherwise, yes, you're completely right. Without coloring Zen, you will end up with the issue of um, by any, I mean, any, using any of the hypervisor services, you might end up trying to cause interference that way. That is prevented and ensured by coloring Zen itself and was actually quite difficult to be honest, was the, maybe the most interesting and challenging part of the project to achieve. Because it involves that you can imagine copying the Xen text into you know a striped fashion and cause, uh, creating a contiguous mapping of, them, of it is it's very technical. So the bare metal, uh, hi Alistair. So if you are referring to the um, to the RQ latency. So that's normal. Uh, ah, you mean the, the one for, not the other one, right? You mean, the, I, I take you mean the test, the, the routine. Um, I bet you mean this. Right, so yes, it's surprising that bare metal alone is lower than bare metal on Zen without interference. However, this is the data and uh, the, uni the university on Modena guides that run this benchmark were extremely thorough and they run thousands of iterations. Um, this is not the first time I see results like that, where running something on Zen is faster than 
running it bare metal. It's not that Xen is magical. It's just that when you enable virtualization, you enable some characteristic of the microarchitecture that end up speeding some things up. So it's surprising. Yes, I agree. But the other thing that is surprising is look at the variance. So the variance goes from 1,700 to 2,100 is a huge variance um, on the results, while on Xen, the variance is minimal. That is surprising too. Does cash coloring affect cash locality? Yes, it does affect the cash and it does affect performance. Uh, that's normal. Uh, in, so, of course, uh, normally when uh, you have a bare metal application running natively, the old cache is available to you. If you use cache coloring, you effectively limit the size of the cache for the given application. So you're really going from a much higher cache size to a much smaller cache size. So it does affect performance. And um, um, so here on this result is not actually visible because it's, well, it's, um, it's in fact faster. But if you run a more uh, com a complex or a larger benchmark, you should see a bit of a slowdown. This is what I was saying before, right? If you run a benchmark without interference, you should expect the cache coloring will be slightly slower. If cache coloring is faster, it's surprising, right? It should be slower without interference. It's when you add interference that really cache coloring make a difference because it prevents interference from having an effect. Yeah, it's it's surprising. So I, uh, as a reference, this is the, se the second or the third time that I saw that something running on an hypervisor is faster than not running it on an hypervisor, and it will it happened on x86 two in the past. So seen it with my own eyes. So it's it's rare, but it, it can happen. All right. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, so if you are interested in, uh, in more, uh, first of all, yes, download the slides. You will make them available immediately after the presentation and stay tuned on Zen Devel when we're going to post the, um, cache coloring patches soon, probably in the next month or two. Uh, you can already try them out and I'll show you again the link. Uh, actually it's later. Uh, and, um, you can test it. Uh, yourself at home, and you should definitely be able to reproduce these results yourself. Uh, that's the link uh, with all the patches. So um, that's it, and thank you all for joining.